It's the Mike Missanelli Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Mike Missanelli Podcast. This is podcast number 97, Thursday, July 13th, brought to us by Bet Rivers. And today, uh, we're going to go right into the substance uh, of this particular podcast, right into our special guest, because it's really important to do so. Of course, is uh, uh, a very popular uh, ex-Flyer, and now the new general manager of the Philadelphia Flyers, tasked with a major rebuild for this significant organization. Let's welcome in Mr. Danny Briere. Danny, how are you doing today? Hi, hi guys. I'm doing great. Hope, uh, hopefully you guys are doing good, too. Yes, it's uh, uh, except for the stifling heat uh, here, I, I think we're, uh, we're, we're pretty good. Uh, so, Danny, uh, listen, uh, thanks for coming on, first of all. And I know that uh, things are going a mile a minute for you at, at this at this particular time. So so how are you handling this so far into this big step of management? Uh, it's been a blast. Um, you know, I, I've been I've been working on the business side since I retired. I got started to get involved a little bit more on the hockey side with player development and kind of made my way up. Um, you know, it, it just felt like it was a, a natural step. Um, I, I feel um, excited and honored to to be tasked with this job. Let's talk about uh, Keith Jones, the president, said this is a new era of orange. Uh, what does that mean exactly to you? Um, it's uh, it's a reset. I think we uh, we need to uh, do it the right way. We you know I, we've said that quite a bit, and I know it's uh, redundant a little bit. But uh, building from the base, uh, I felt the the last you know probably ten years um, there's all the patchwork that was done. Uh, the Flyers were always kind of stuck in in the middle of the pile, um, never good enough to kind of go all the way, but um, always hanging on to just trying to make the playoffs one year, miss the playoff the next. And and the goal of the new era is to rebuild from the base, a solid base uh, that will carry us for many years into hopefully uh, being contenders for, for years to come. Okay, explain explain how you construct this kind of a base. I know you want to do it with a lot of, of young talent and draft picks, but you also have a, a quite a number of veterans still on the roster. So what, you know, what is the plan and, and how long uh, do flyer fans need to wait for this to take root? Well, yeah, yes, there's veterans because the veterans are important too. You, you need good veterans. And that's, that's the key there. Uh, you need veterans to lead the way to teach the young guys how to be pros. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. And that's, that goes back to not believing in, in tanking. Also, I, I we all want a, a competitive team that our fans are going to be excited to, to go watch play. They're going to be, be hopefully competitive every, every night, but they're going to work hard um, because that that's part of the base that we want to build um, with our team moving forward. And then the veterans are important to kind of lead the way uh, with that structure. Uh, but realizing that, you know, the kids are important. The kids are going to be uh, given the chance to, to see what they have. You know, you look in the past and when, when you have star players, like Claude Giroux and Jake Voracek, you know, it's tough to move them out of the way uh, and, and give the young guys the chance to play and uh, get big minutes and uh, big responsibilities. So, um, you know, we, we want to give, we, we saw it last year up front. You, know, you saw guys like uh, Tippett, Konechny, Cates, Frost, all these guys, even Farabee, have a lot more responsibility, have a, uh, responsibilities, a lot more uh, play time, both uh, on offense and on defense. So that's kind of what we mean by uh, rebuilding from the base. What's what's necessary to win in hockey these days? Now, you, you came in an era where I think you recognized uh, what, what the changes needed to be made. And the Flyers, frankly, were in kind of a, a stodgy mindset. So the NHL in, in 2023, what wins? Hey, it's a good question. It, it changes. You know, I think there's many ways that you can win. You you saw the Tampa Bay win with a lot of skill. Um, you you saw the St. Louis Blues win with with size and grit. Uh, you know, again, uh, Boston uh, did it that way. This year, Vegas did it that way. But Pittsburgh. Um, I mentioned Tampa Bay, uh, Carolina's is a good up and coming team. Buffalo's a good up and coming team. Carolina as well, and they're all built around skills. So, uh, I think it's a mix of both, and it's fine trying to find that right combination. You know, as the Flyers go, um, I, I think the grit. Um, 
is an important component, but we're not the Broad Street bullies anymore. You don't win that way. It's just past its prime. And and we realize that. But at the same time, um, we want a team that is competitive and going to be tough to play against and it's going to show up on most nights. Did the old regime just not realize that? I, I think they did. I, I think it's um, I think it, it was trying to change. I there's just a little bit too much, you know, patchwork that just did not connect. Um, but, you know, I, I was around the last couple of years and and obviously they, they knew that you, you couldn't win with just uh, the, the tough guys and uh, trying to scare people out of the building. It just doesn't happen anymore. Talking to Danny Briere, general manager of the Flyers. Uh, now, Danny, there, you've heard it a million times. People have thrown it at you. This uh, ex-Flyer in management stigma. And uh, in the past, it, it, frankly, it got old. So uh, yeah, I think people are trying to think, do you guys have a, a modern feel for hockey as opposed to maybe what happened in the past? What's the difference? What's the difference going to be for, with you guys, you, this ex-Flyer contingent? Yeah, I, well, I, I think we do. Um, I hope we do also. Um, no, that's that's my belief. I've I've had the chance to play for, for different teams, not just the Flyers. Um, uh, you know, I was part of the rebuild in, in Montreal after I played for uh, for the Flyers. I was part of the early days in Colorado um, in in their rebuild as well when Nate McKinnon was was just starting with the team. Um, so I, I've seen different ways. I've seen different ways the teams were built. Um, so yeah, I, I I do believe so, and I, I think with. You just look at uh, at our draft this year. We, you know, drafting a um, no highly skilled uh, Russian player uh, early in the first round. And if you look down the list, and in the third, fourth, fifth round, we went with smaller skilled players with with a lot of talent. So um, yeah, we're open to it. I, I, I think it's finding the right mix that that can take us to the next steps. All right, let's let's talk about your draft pick because I saw it as a, a brilliant value pick. Uh, like you said, this is going to be a rebuild, so you have some years to play with. And uh, so this was a highly skilled player who a lot of people thought was, was the second best player uh, in, in this draft. You guys took a shot, and other teams may not have because of the you know the the hurdles that he, he may have to go through to get here. So it, it was that what your mindset was? Take the skill first. And worry about the other thing later because we have some years to play with. Well, he was he was extremely interesting because we don't have anyone like him in the organization. And and you've heard us say, you know, the last few years how we don't have that difference maker. We don't have the high end uh, skill players, especially after losing guys like Voracek and Giroux. So uh, having a chance or seeing a, a guy of this talent drop to seven for us, uh, we felt was something we just could not pass over. Um, the interesting part on top of it, it was um, Matvey has clearly told us that he wanted to play for the Flyers. He wanted to play in a hockey market uh, where people care about the team. He, he came to visit us. Uh, he had a great attitude the whole time he was here. He blew all of our uh, organization away by his charisma. So uh, we you know, we looked to move up even because we didn't think he'd be there at seven. Uh, but it was it was a nice surprise, and we really felt we could pass him when when he was there available at seven. T- tell me about your communication with him, because obviously, you know, there's a there's a language barrier there, and and sometimes things can get uh, missed. So, uh, you know, tr- track that for me. How you you guys approached him in Russia and uh, and got this necessary uh, satisfaction that he yeah. may even be able to get here soon. Yeah. Well, first of all, you had the translator with him. He had uh, two of his agents with him walking around. He had his, his mom and his brother and, and, and a teammate and they were all walking around and you could, you can tell when people are giggling and smiling the whole time they're here, they're going through our facilities and in Voorhees and, you know, they're just, you know, wowed and, and impressed by the setup that we have. And, you know, we take him to the locker room and he sees the jerseys and, you know, we showed him where he would be sitting and stuff like that. You, you could tell that he was, uh, he was really excited about that. Um, and then he, we got in the room with him one-on-one. Well, there's like three-on-three, I guess, with, with our staff and them. And uh, we started asking him the, the, t- the tough questions. You know, why was he moved around last year? You know, we had a, heard some rumblings, um, you know, about his character, uh, why he was so tough on his teammates. And he said himself, he's like, look, I made some mistakes. I, I was young. He's like, I want to win more than anybody. And I don't accept when people are, are not working hard. So uh, I'm learning. And, and look, we, we have to remember he's a 17-year-old kid who's ultra, ultra competitive. And when we talk to other players that 
knew him or had played with him, that's the one thing that kept coming back about him is how ultra competitive he was. So, um, you know, everything checked for us. Obviously, there's still there's still some risk. We, we understand that. We have to wait three years, but kind of fit into what we're trying to do with with the rebuild. And and hopefully when, when it's time, we get a player that can make a difference when he comes over. Can he be Malkin or Ovechkin? <laughs> I, I don't want to put that, people that say. type of pressure on, on him. I, you know, if he can come in and uh, make the team when he comes over and he can play in our, in our top six, that'll be a win. Uh, whatever else he gets us on top of that uh, will be bonus. You know, in that whole process, you really have to be ultra trusting of the interpreter, right? <laughs> Definitely. Um, and, and, and the good thing is we had a Russian um, scout on our staff, too, that was helping us translate. And, and when he left, you know, it was uh, he, he was on par with them, with what they were saying. So it, it sounded it sounded good anyway. But but the smile to me, the smile uh, said it all. Danny, here, here's why your resume, uh, I, you know, the people that look at this as maybe just as another ex-flyer were maybe a little wronged because you did take the necessary steps, as you alluded to. Um, you, you, you made sure you got a, a ward and business background. You did all kinds of lower level uh, management things. When did you think that you wanted to do this and get into hockey, uh, that that side of hockey administration from being a player? I am. Um... I, I didn't know. I don't know exactly when it started. I, I remember as a player, always looking around, looking at different teams, how they were built. Um, I never saw myself as a coach. I never had a huge interest in in trying to break down films uh, after game, what the four checks were on the other team. The coaches were doing that. I was more always more interested in in, in building t- things. Um, you know, the makeup of a team, what fits, uh, trying to f- fit. You know, we say uh, a square. Uh, peg in, in a round hole or vice versa <laughs> but uh, that's the part that I was always interested in and when I when I retired the uh, you know I started following um, you know, Paul Holmgren around um, what he was doing as the president and I spent a lot of time on the business side and uh, all of a sudden you know Comcast Spectacore bought a, a minor league team ECHL team which is uh, double A, uh, if you compare to baseball, would be double A for hockey. Um, and, you know, got the chance to build a team from scratch in, in Maine, in Portland, Maine. And that was super interesting, having a chance to do both sides. And the cool thing there is, yeah, I learned the business side, but I was also the general manager and I was building a team with Riley Armstrong. Um, and then things kind of evolved from there. I got involved in player, player development where I could get in touch with the players and really spend time with them um, and into this, this next role, assistant GM. And then now today. And so as a, as a player, you were actually looking at how components would fit on a team. That, that was, that, that, that's the stuff that I love doing, um, how teams were built, you know, what worked, how, how you could win, you know, how a third line should be built and how is your second pairing on defense should be built and, you know, what were the best combinations. So that, that's always something. And I think, too, it started with me. I realized early on I had teammates that it just meshed with. I got on the ice. We didn't have to think about anything. It just clicked. You know, and I, I always tried to find out why does it work with certain players and it doesn't work with others. I remember the Coyotes one year, they went out and uh, they, they signed Tony Amante. Tony Amante was at the time one of the best U.S. American player in the NHL. And, you know, he comes and we're supposed to play together and it, it never clicked. And I was always wondering, like, why? And we can find each other on the ice and it's just it never click. And then. You know, I go to Buffalo and I'm playing with uh, Jochen Hecht and J.P. Dumont, who were half the players that Tony Amante was. But all of a sudden, th- there's just chemistry there. And and why was that? You know, and I tried. And you guys probably remember the line when when I came here and eventually I played with Scott Hartnell and Ville Leno. Um, it, it just clicked. And it was the best feeling in the world when you go on the ice and you don't have to think about it. There's chemistry there. So that that's those are the kinds of things that I, I was always loved trying to figure out um you know and it evolves now into um building a team that way did you ever voice that to any of your coaches i, I tried to um you know and, and some were super responsive some were not um you know i i always remember i would try to go to the coach because the coaches were so worried with matchups you know and and i would try to go to the coaches with with lavi especially and i would tell lavi look i don't care if i'm playing against jonathan tapes I can play against Jonathan Taves. Just get me away from 
Duncan Keith and Brent Seabrook. So if you see the, the, the pairing on defense going to the second or third pairing, that's when I want to know. That's when I want to go. Don't worry about, about tapes. I can handle them. Um, so those are the things sometimes that I tried to, to get in with, with the coach. It was more of a, again, tactics and, you know, piece of the puzzle trying to take an advantage that way. So what, did Lavi shut you down? No, Lavi was actually really receptive to, to that okay. stuff. Uh, it was pretty cool. Uh, let me ask you this question about Tortorella. And, um, you know, listen, he's a veteran coach. He's a very demanding coach. And, I, you know, on, at first blush, it wouldn't look like he's the perfect fit for a, a three-year rebuild to blow it up and, and to build it back. Um, do you have any concerns about that? And what conversations have you had with him about yeah, that? That's, and that's the funny thing. That's the appearance from, from the outside. We always assume that Torts is so tough, so demanding that he, he can't work. He just wants veterans. And But you look at his track record, he actually does really well with young players. And I think part of that is that, you know, unlike a lot of coaches, is he, he doesn't care if the players have played 15 years in the league. He wants the best team on the ice. And, and now he's on board. Like he, he said it many times last year publicly. Him and I have had many discussions about that. He understands how critical it is uh, to develop the young guys. He's, I mean, you saw what he did last year with with the young guys that I mentioned earlier, the, the Tippett, Konechny, Frost, Cates, Farabee. Um, now we understand that we need to do that with our defense a little bit more as well. But it's it's been pretty amazing how open he's been to it. And I'm, I'm comfortable and I'm really confident that Torts is, is the right guy at the moment. He's demanding, yes, but... He's building a, a strong standard and culture for our young guys. And that's why we try to give them veterans that um, are, are on board and good veterans that understand what he's doing. The guys like Couturier and Atkinson and, uh, you know, Mark Stahl, who has played with him, and he wants to come back here at the end of his career. That, I mean, to me, that says, that says a lot about, you know, about torts as well. You know, Jones also said this is going to be a collaborative type of situation, but uh, that, uh, do you believe you have final say on, on everything? Personnel choices, we, trades, free agent signings, uh, uh, who, you put, who you make, the, uh, what guys make this team? Are you the guy? What, what I can tell you is that we work together. Um, you know, I, I have a strong opinion, but I also am um, – understanding that I don't have all the answers and I need sometimes people to step up and tell me, you know, this is, this is not the right way. And that's why I like having people that have, are not afraid to, to speak their opinion. I want people and I'm trying to hire people around me that are not afraid to speak their opinion. Um, so we, we work together and, you know, I, I hope I'm open-minded enough to realize at time that, you know, I don't have all the answers. Okay. So th if there's a tie, Jones likes one player. You like the other player. Who wins? <laughs> I mean, we might have to drop the gloves here and there, um, but you know, we'll we'll find a way. We'll find a solution. I, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that Dan, you interview well when you go on job interviews. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Danny, let me let me uh, uh, swing it now to uh, some personnel matters. Now you, you subtracted Proveroff and Kevin Hayes. Um, I, you know, what, what are your opinions on, on, uh, the Proberoff, uh, thing there, you know, there were a lot of things that were whispered about that he wasn't a great teammate. Uh, and you know, Hayes, a lot of people are upset that the, that would be a veteran that, that you would go, what was the idea and moving all, uh, on from those two guys? Well, in the Proveroff case, um, you know, the, the value that we got in return, uh, felt we, we couldn't pass beside that. And, you know, he, he wanted more. He wanted more responsibilities. And, and we didn't feel that, um, you know, it was warranted at, at this time. Um, and it's tough for players to sometimes uh, agree to that. Um, you know, Torts and him had, had a good relationship, but, but Provi wanted more. And, you know, we, we also wanted to let our younger guys like York and Adder and Zamula kind of do a little bit more. So the value that he, we got in return in that trade, we just felt we can pass beside. In Hayes' case is a little tougher. Um, the relationship with Torts off the ice was fine. Um, you know, Torts always said he liked the guy, he loves the guy, and his teammates always had good things to say about Kevin. But uh, it was getting toxic, toxic with the way 
Torts was using him. Um, and uh, it, I felt it was better to give him the chance to go somewhere else just so he doesn't, you know, stay around the room uh, that it evolves in, in, in a better way for everybody involved. We didn't want that. Kevin's a really very respected uh, teammate in the room, and, and we felt we didn't want that to to be him to be sour so that was uh the main reason obviously the value wasn't there for for him because of his contract but at the end of the day sometimes you have to do the right thing for uh for everybody involved and for him also uh the goaltender situation uh, a lot of whispers that you were going to ready to move carter hart he's still here you got a backup goalie uh in the interim what's the situation with him right now as as far as you know being a a very important player for this team. Is yeah. he still or not? He is. He is. I, and I, I want to clear the air on that. You know, I, I said that I was open for business on anybody on the team, including Carter, including, uh, you know, Travis Konechny. Um, and I did receive a lot of calls on those guys, but I never shopped them. It's not like I was calling teams trying to trade them. To be honest, net, nothing serious ever uh, arose from the Carter Hart trade. So there's never a moment where he was tra uh, close to being traded. Um, he's our number one. He's our goalie of the future. Now, things can always change if, if someone, you know, calls. But we believe in Carter, and, and at the moment, we see him as, as our goalie of the future. All right. I want to move on. I asked, uh, you know, Flyer fans are among the most loyal in this city, uh, and they hang with you a lot, and they're – they're very interested in what's happening. So I asked some Flyer fans to send me some questions they might want answered yeah. from you. And I hope, you're, I hope you're up for that. So uh, let's go with the first one I received. And uh, the, the questioner says, if you're in a full rebuild, why sign non-impact older players to contracts? I assume he's alluding to Garrett Hathaway. Uh, doesn't that clog up the system for, for younger guys? Well, I, I would disagree with non-impactful players. I think these guys can can have a great impact, can have a great impact, first of all, in the room. There's there's a reason we did some background checks on on those guys, uh, Paling, um, Hathaway, Mark Stahl. They're all they're all great character guys. They're all loved by their teammates. Um, so that was that was very important when you're part of a rebuild and you're trying to build the culture um, that we want to build here. That was critical. Um, and then on top. Uh, of that on the ice. Paling's young, obviously. There's still a lot of upsides there. Um, Hathaway is extremely tough to, to play against, and that's what's exciting to us. It's a two-year contract, um, you know, and, and it's like I, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. We want to be careful with how we bring our kids into the system. We don't want to just bring a bunch of kids and let them play and let them uh, you know, find out for themselves how things are being done, how it is to be a, a pro. Guys like um, Hathaway are, are very critical to that, and that's why we did it on, on a short-term deal that we felt was um, going to help us uh, both on the ice, being tough to play against, but also in the locker room. That that presser uh, generated a little bit of controversy with a live mic. I know you, you guys addressed that, but how shocking was that? Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, it wasn't our proudest moment, um, but it, it was a mistake that we're we're gonna learn from. Um, you know, we're we're trying to have and build a good relationship with uh, with our fans, but with the media also, and we're trying to be, um, you know, open minded uh, and also more transparent than than we've been in the past. So, um, to us, the yeah, the the relationship uh, is. is really important moving forward and we'll try to rectify that we apologize to gianna um you know we felt sorry to put her in that position and uh, hopefully we, we learn from that mistake second question is so with all the organizational changes of the, what have been the most difficult transition into this new era of flyers hockey i don't know it's 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 been actually really exciting um to to build to put our own stamp on it what has been probably the the most difficult would probably be having to let go of some some good people that have been in the organization for for a long time. We had to make some changes, uh, you know, to to bring our vision into the fold. And unfortunately, you know, some some people paid the price uh, for that. And, and that was probably for me the toughest part. Uh, next question is a frivolous one, but it's pretty funny. Uh, do you get tired of all the people telling you you look like a young Paul McCartney? <laughs> 
<laughs> I've heard that here and there. Um, I, you, I mean, no, it's a compliment. Um, no, I, I, I wish I could sing like he did, uh, but uh, you, can't, you can't do a Beatles tune. No, and, and, definitely, you know, like, I love the Beatles. Like karaoke at some time with uh, you know? No, you don't. You don't want to hear that. You'd you'd be running <laughs> for the door. Uh, all right. Um, uh, what's holding up the D'Angelo trade? One of uh, your fans wants to know. <laughs> it's been a little quiet on that front. Um, you know, we're still looking into it to see. Uh, we're, we're looking at all of our options. Obviously, with Tony, the the fact is that it, it's not healthy with uh, with the locker room situation and him not dressing at the end of the year last year. So we're we're well aware of that. And um, there's a couple of little hiccups that we're trying to iron out. Um, you know, with uh, with league rules and such, with right? league rules. Yeah. And obviously, we all know with Carolina. So um, it, you know, it, we're it's still a work in progress. But at this point, it's uh, it's been pretty quiet. Is there a chance that he remains with the team? Um, I, I would say it's pretty slim at this point uh, because of, you know, what happened at the end of the season. But uh, every option still on the table. But that one is probably one of the lowest. All right. Next fan question. Is this realistically a four to five year process to really see this team content? <laughs> I've, I've, I haven't put a timeline on it uh, as far as number of years. Uh, the players will help dictate that. Obviously, the Mishkov uh, draft tells you a lot about it, but um, we want to make sure that we build a team that's going to be a contender for for years to come. That's that's the goal. You know, I, I'd rather not get into the the amount of years because people are are just going to be focusing on that. The important part is making sure the team is progressing in the right direction, um, and, and that like again that we become you know a strong a strong team, a strong contender for years to come. Uh, here's another fan question. These fans can sometimes get get de deliver good questions that are probing. What do you bring to the table that is unique, and how do you react to the opinion that you lack experience in this role? <laughs> well, there's there's been a lot of rookie GMs, um, you know, lately. Uh, I, I think there's a mindset change uh, around the league, um, so I I don't think I'm at a disadvantage at all. I've known. Most of these guys that are all GM, I feel comfortable with them. I've played against or with them uh, over the course of my career, so um, I have no worries. I, you know, I was sitting in the locker room with Chris Drury and and Mike Greer in Buffalo for for a few years, and we had a great relationship. And you know that that keeps going today. Uh, I'm not saying we're going to be making trades, but you know we we can share ideas and and bounce things off of each other. Uh, two last questions from the fans. Uh, you were born in Quebec. This is a very good question. You were born in Quebec. You played in other cities. Why did you choose to stay in Philadelphia? What was it about this area that lured you? I, uh, when I came here, I fell in, in love with the place. Um, my kids grew up here. Uh, I had a lot of success on the ice. I felt I had a pretty good, strong relationship with, with the fan base. Um, that when I retired, you know, and I met my wife is from here as well. Kids, like I mentioned, had grown up that this is what they considered their their hometown. Um, it, it was I didn't even have to think about it when I retired. I knew I was coming coming back here. This is the place that that I love and feel connected with uh, with the team and the fans. And the last question from the fan is: What is your cheesesteak go to shop? And when you're there, what do you order? Um, <laughs> there's a lot of good places. Um, but I would have to say probably Geno's for me. Um, and I, you know, I loaded up whiz wit. Loaded the right term. That was a loaded Gino's question. Whiz wit. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, just a couple of other questions here. Cause you, you alluded to your wife, Misha and my sources tell me that even though you have a cool job as general manager of a uh, NHL hockey team and a, and a very good organization that your wife actually has a cooler job than you. What is that? So um, she was a flight surgeon in the Air Force. So she was part of uh, uh, flight, um, uh, what do you call them? Um, I, I have a blank here, but she was a part of a squadron. And wherever these guys would deploy, F-15s would deploy all over the world, she would follow them. Um, she had uh, a, a couple stints overseas in Afghanistan and the UAEs and stuff like that. So uh, it was pre it's pretty cool. Sometimes when we get in a room and, and it's, uh, we'd be sitting at a table with hockey fans, they start asking me about, you know, what I do and, you know, 
my goals and ambitions and all that. And all of a sudden someone will turn towards her and, and ask her, you know, what's her background and what does she do? And, and all of a sudden everybody focuses on her and it's like, I can fade in the background and nobody cared about what I do. Uh, so it's actually pretty cool. She has a cool job and now she's a, uh, um, an internist and doing a fellowship in sports medicine with, uh, with Penn and Chop here in the city. So it's pretty cool. Uh, I, I got to ask you this question, and I, I hope it's not too personal, but it, since it was in the news, a lot of people say, well, you have to ask him about it. And uh, and I just want to ask, as a dad, uh, how you perceive this. Your, your son got into a little snafu recently, and uh, when you're a celebrity, it kind of reflects on you. And I know that in the past yeah. in my radio life, it, it has done that. So when that happened, what what as your, as a dad, how did you handle it? Well, I, I'll tell you right away, I wasn't worried about me. Um, I, I was more worried about him and how he would come out of it. Obviously, he was he was very embarrassed. Um, it wasn't an easy situation, not something that he was proud of. Uh, but what I was proud of of him is that he, he never hid behind anything that he did. He was at the forefront. He, he, he owned, owned up to him, um, admitted that he made a mistake and um went out and reached out for some help, uh, started getting involved with the, the Warrior Hockey Program here that uh, Flyers alumni are involved with. So I, it's been pretty cool to see the, the turnaround in him as a gentleman. It was an eye-opener. It was a wake-up call, a hard wake-up call for him that – where he probably played the price a lot more than most people do uh, in a mistake like this, but he never complained once. He owned up to him, and that's that's what makes him makes me proud of him. Uh, but um, yeah, not not an easy situation to go. Well, through. what was your what first conversation with him? Like, uh, I, I, how did you did you handle it by just hearing him out, scolding him? Like, how, yeah, no, I, I first listened to him. He called me before everything broke through, so I, I knew it was coming. Um, again, I, I was I was impressed that he he came up to me right away when it happened before it came out publicly uh you know and told me that he had screwed up um you know and he was embarrassed and he felt sorry that i, I would be stuck in it. and i said don't worry about me focus let's focus on you um you know the first conversation was pretty quiet but obviously um you know there was a couple tough tough um conversation that we had uh him and i about being a better person a better um you have to do just do better in the community and how you treat people. Um, so, uh, you know, it's one of those mistakes that hopefully turns into a positive for, for him as, as uh, growing from a teenager to an, an adult. Danny, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for, uh, for answering uh, all the questions that we had. And thanks for coming on. We wish you nothing but the best of the luck. I and everybody in the city would like the Flyers to, to raise up again. Uh, there's a lot of teams that are making some noise. So, uh, yeah, we like to see the Flyers also get into that conversation. So, best of luck you, to guys. you, and uh, thank you for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Mike and Darren. See you guys. Thank you, Danny. I appreciate that. Dan, that was great. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your time. That was fantastic. Really appreciate it. Get back to work now. All right? Good. Let's go. <laughs> no, great. It's the Mike Missanelli Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. All righty. Thanks to Danny Briere for coming on and, and, and answering all the questions that I had and uh, some Flyer fans uh, had for him. Uh, hopefully this takes root. I mean, he, he's, he says all the right things. I think he's a good enough hockey man to get it done. And we just have to see how long this is going to take with his mindset and, and the other guys that have been hired uh, within the organization to turn this around and uh, do it the right way uh, with the 2023 methodology of playing hockey in the NHL. So again, thanks to Danny. Uh, let's get into a little bit of Mike Unleashed today. A short Mike Unleashed. I just have one topic to talk about. And it was something that I uh, put out on Twitter a couple days ago when I was watching the All-Star game. And Eduardo Perez was asked about uh, the availability of Nolan Arenado. Of course, the uh, St. Louis Cardinals are pretty much out of it. And they are, they are probably in a transition mode where guys like Goldschmidt and Arenado could probably be had. So... Uh, with the with the backdrop of that, Eduardo Perez came in. And they asked him what teams would be a good fit for Arenado. One of the teams he mentioned was the Philadelphia Phillies, which was kind of surprising to me. But I played along with the concept of it, and I put it out on Twitter that Eduardo Perez has said this. What, what say you? 
Um, if the price ha- and the price would undoubtedly have to be Bohm included in the deal, you're getting a third baseman. They'd want a young third baseman back. I know they have Jordan Walker, but they're playing him in right field, and maybe he positions better in the outfield to, to preserve his bat. Uh, so uh, Bohm would be a good exchange for them, and and maybe something else, maybe a, a prospect to get Nolan Arenado. So he's 32 years old, and he may be the best fielding third baseman of all time. And there's Mike Schmidt, there's Brooks Robinson, I understand, but the the baseball people to look at this guy said he may be the best ever. Uh, He's also a hitter. He hasn't had great postseason success, but he's 32 with five years on the deal left. So uh, I asked the question just basically, hypothetically, whether Philly fans would be on board. Some would say it's a no-brainer, but others Fought it tooth and nail. How dare you? Bra- Bob's younger and Arenado's 32 years old. Bob, you're going to mess up the chemistry. Blah, blah. And here's the thing I don't understand about Phil- Phil- Philadelphia fans. They sometimes get attached to a player emotionally without considering the other end of it. Like, there's no question in my mind that Nolan Arenado, as a power right-handed bat, in between all these lefties that they have, would solidify the Phillies lineup for the rest of the year. You also have to fa- factor in that Dave Dombrowski is a guy who would make a deal like that. He is a guy who acts in the now. And, and so what's happening? And Bohm's a nice player, and he's turning into a nice player, and I like him. And I think he's made great strides at third base. I was one of the guys that you got to keep him there because he's he's got enough fluidity to be a decent third baseman. But he ain't Arenado, and he's not a power hitter like Arenado. He's not going to hit 30 home runs. Ever. So uh, I I would say that if you're trying to clinch yourself a World Series and get back to the World Series, is it a better bet to go with an Arenado considering it's a new guy that you're rushing in? It's a chemistry thing. I get it. You're giving up on a younger player. Uh, Does all that make? Let me bring Darren in here because I got to be honest with you. I (laughs) I look at it differently. I look at the talent level of a player. And I don't get involved in the emotional thing. I don't get involved in the the chemistry. Baseball is not chemistry. Baseball is about you getting into the freaking batter's box and doing your job. And when you get out in the field with the glove to do your job. And collectively, when everybody does his job, that's how you win baseball games. It's not like you got to get the assist to the guy cut back door or you got to call the play and throw a block for the running back. It's It's not that. Baseball is an individualistic sport. And the more talented individuals that you can add to a team, I believe gives you a better chance to win. And sometimes you have to sacrifice. A guy like Bohm two years ago, nobody was thinking that highly of him to the point where he would be an untouchable. So, Darren, what's your feeling on this? I'm looking at it both ways, right? So I agree with you. Arenado is one of my favorite players in the majors. And and I I would do anything to get him. And, yeah, I'd give up Bohm for him. But here's my one concern, and that's that the Phillies have a – like a lot of their core – are not the youngest guys in the world. Like they need some young guys to keep the, the you know, we don't want to do 08, 09, 2010, and then the team is gone for three years. Like we just garbage because everybody's retired and old and there's nobody young to, to pass the torch to. Bohm's five years younger than him, maybe five and a half years younger than him. So they need some young guys that can play. I love Arenado though. Like I, he's like I said, he might be my favorite non-Philly in the majors. Uh, I would do the deal. Dombrowski would definitely do that deal. You're right about him. He's not getting any younger. And but I, I, that would be a concern of mine. Like you know, three years from now, you'll have Harper, you'll have Turner, you'll have Arenado, you'll have Real Muto. These guys are going to be old in three years. In the meantime, you're giving you a chance to. Uh, I, chance I know. To I told you I do the deal, here. but it's going to be. So, so here's the question. Here is the question. To me, your point was is way secondary to the concept of who gives you the better chance to win a World Series. Oh, it's definitely Arenado, and I I said I would do the well, deal. Well, then that's the end of story. See, that's to me the end of story. You can't say, "Well, down the road we're going to be this." You have to in baseball. You have to act in the right. now. Do the deal. You can't worry about three, you know, four years down the road. You're still going to have that core for a significant amount of three to four years that can win every year if you keep it intact. So I, I don't understand that. I guess it's my confusion with with Philadelphia fans that sometimes they get so taken with the wrong things 
when the only thing that should count here is what gives you a better chance to win a title? That's the way it should always be. And and down the road, you think about it, the, the Phillies have at single A, they have a record setting team right now. They're like 50 and 14 or whatever it is. So they, they've got some stuff in the minor leagues that will eventually come up and they'll be able to use some players, including that Justin Crawford guy. Well, I look at Arenado and he's got a 290 lifetime average. He's hit 318 home runs so far. His OPS is, uh, let's see, his own base percentage is 345, which is solid. His OPS career in in 11 years is 879, and he's the best fielding third baseman in the game. So, like, I go, seriously? Are we even questioning that? Now, a lot of people go, well, I, yeah, I'd, I'd like Arenado. You can move Bohm to first base. And I'm going, in what world do you think they're not going to ask for Bohm? What, are they going to ask for scraps? Yeah, give me some scraps. And I'll trade. They're going to want a replacement. Bohm is an obvious guy they would ask for. So, like, people. Yeah, it's not the NBA. They don't need a salary dump. Yeah, you know, like, people look. Like, they, they think, well, you can have your. Like, we can have your. And, and Philadelphia fans make this mistake all the time. Yeah, we can get this guy and we'll give him X, Y, and Z. Crap. And they'll just give us one of the best players in the game. <laughs> and that's what, like, frustrates me to no end. But anyway, it's, it's fun to do these kind of arguments because you get opinions on Twitter that are really interesting. They go from one side to the other. And uh, I, I'm, uh, you know, this not this concept of, of Bohm, he's going to mess up your chemistry if you get rid of him. Like, oh, come on, man. This is baseball, all right? I get it in the, in the clubhouse. You got to kind of get along. But, you know, a guy like Turner joins Harper, what that chemistry wasn't going to be good. Like, pro players respect pro players. Uh, and, and, and when they're all around, they respect each other. So I don't see where Nolan Arenado Nolan Arenado is going to mess up the chemistry. So, all right, that's that's the only thing I wanted to talk about on Mike Unleashed for today. Give you food for thought. And, again, if you have a response to that, hit me up with an email, mike at mikemiss.com, and I'll uh, I'll read your responses to this. I've, I've read a lot on, on Twitter, and uh, it fascinates me. Right, little arguments like this fascinates me. Uh, all right, Darren, we haven't done three questions. We try to do it every Thursday. So let's do uh, some three questions today for Mikey Miss. Let's let's do a few questions. All right, Mike. So question number one today, uh, you and I have the have similar vices in that they are red wine, uh, a good bourbon and a good cigar. Uh, So let's just say you and I are out for the night and the tab is comped. I want to know what red. We're going to take Natalie Vineyards out of this. Uh, I want to know what red wine uh, you would select. I want to know what bourbon you would select with what cigar would you select? Anything and any, anyone and anything. Um, well, I, the bourbon, uh, I, I like uh, a bourbon called Breckenridge. And uh, that's from Colorado. I've been and there. I, I was out in Colorado and, yeah. and I had this Breckenridge and it was smooth as silk. And it, maybe it has something to do with the Rocky Mountain water that it's made with, but uh, it, 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 you can get it here, but it's scarce. I think you can get it in Jersey state stores. So that's, that would be my, my go-to bourbon. Um, but you know, listen, I, I, I like bullet. I like wood, Woodridge, you know, I, anything that, that is smooth. I'm, I'm good with, uh, the wine. I have a special affection for this winery in Napa called Hall Hall's vineyards. And, uh, they, they, they produce a, a Cabernet that is like red silk. And it's called Catherine Hall. Uh, and, and she's the matriarch of, of the whole Hall winery business. Uh, and it, it, listen, it's it's not cheap. It's like a $300 bottle of Cabernet. So, I'm writing it down. I'm like, oh, yeah, what one yeah. Oh, well, never so, mind. And I have a couple that I only bring out for special occasions. But if I'm going to go to and I'm going to go with Red Silk, it's that wine. But they're also the same company produces a really good Pinot called Walt. W-A-L-T, and uh, I have a, a lot of bottles of Walt Pinot, which is a little a little easier and smoother uh, drinking on the palate. And the cigar, listen, I've told you many times, it's the Monte Cristo white label. It never lets me down. It's not overly harsh. Oh, you know, people make the mistake of saying, you know, overly. I have to have the overly harsh cigar, and I go, eh, it's not pleasant after a while. It bites too much. So I like a smooth cigar, and to me, that's the perfect blend, that white label Monte Cristo for me. All right. That's question number one. Question number two. 
In the, oh God, the NFL offseason is annoying to me. A a million articles written about things you don't care about. Someone brought up the point, is Andy Reid the best coach? I don't know. I don't care. Who are the Mikey Miss? Who's the best coach of all time in all four major sports? The best coach of all time in all four major sports. Uh, I'm making you think today. I'm sorry. uh, I I, I, got to go Belichick. You have. I, I guess I hate, you do I, by default. You have. To. I hate to do it. Uh, I got to go Belichick uh, in all uh, four major sports, and you know, in basketball, you have you have a discussion. Uh, in, in baseball, it really is irrelevant because I don't believe that anybody influences a baseball game as a manager that much as as other sports do. Um, so uh, I, I settle on, on on Belichick. Okay, the other three. Uh, for every other sport, yeah. For now, go baseball and then go. <laughs> I'm, I'm well, you know, I mean, that. like baseball is almost impossible. I, I like you. I can't come up with a manager who's been, you know, that has made that much of a difference, uh, other than the, the team was just good. So I, I have to discount a manager. I don't even put a manager okay. in the equation, okay? Because I don't think they do as much you, as the you, others. Oh, there's no. Ma- you have a baseball team. You're the general manager. You can pluck any manager from history. Who would you put, who would you pluck? I, I, nothing comes up. All right, like I don't know Sparky Anderson, but my God, look at that team Sparky Anderson. Yeah, had. I know. You know, uh, so yeah. like baseball is a reflection of players that perform, and what you what, as a manager, what you the only thing you can do is influence guys' confidence in a, in a clubhouse. And at the end of the day, I can put together a lineup. I can do basic baseball bell strategy. It's a matter when that guy takes the rubber, he's got to do his job. And when a guy gets in batter's box, he's got to do his job. And I don't think a manager has any influence on that. Okay. <laughs> he doesn't play design. He doesn't do anything. Uh, all right. So hockey, I don't know. Scotty Bowman. You want to go with Scotty Bowman? <laughs> I'm, Fair. I'm okay with that. And in basketball, um, you know. I, pop? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Pop has got this reputation. I, uh, it's too he's too much for me. So I, I got yeah. I uh, Phil Jackson obviously has is, is got to be in the conversation. But I, I always thought Larry Brown, the way he teaches and the way he makes players responsible, uh, I, I I ride with Larry Brown because I've been around him. I've seen him. The fact that he won that championship with Detroit is an amazing coaching job. The fact that he got that six or team to an NBA final is an amazing coaching job. So I he always stands out for me. I'm good with that. Phil Jackson never won anything without one of the two or three greatest basketball players in the history of the game. So I was, I was, I'm never going to put Jackson in that, that high. All right, Mike, it's summertime. Rank the summer holidays for me. July is the greatest month of the year, but rank the three summer holidays, Memorial day, 4th of July and labor day. Uh, I'm a labor day, man. Wow. I am. I'm a, I'm a Labor Day. I hate Labor Day. Fourth of July does nothing for me, as I explained with the fireworks in my my blog. I don't get the fireworks. I don't get the waste of the money with the fireworks. July Fourth is too. It's too much mayhem uh, at at resort areas like the shore. So I don't like July Fourth. Memorial Day is the opening of kind of the summer season. It's okay, but again, it's too crowded. Labor Day is just when everything is settling down. It's calm. You got that that smell of leaves in the air, the smell of football in the air. I like it. That works for me. I couldn't possibly disagree with you more. I love the July, July. Fourth, man. No, I don't care about fireworks. I just love a warm ocean and a cool ocean breeze. Yeah. Like that's the great. I'm, I'm past the ocean. I don't <laughs> even go in anymore. I live on the beach. Were you with John Clark boogie boarding? <laughs> All right. Not too old for that, too. All right, that's three questions. Shut it down. All right. Uh, let's close it down. Thanks again to Danny Briere. I love, I, I really enjoy revealing conversations. And uh, if you listen to this podcast, you know that that's what I, I, I try to, 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 you know, get get out some information that you may not know and, and get uh, people to talk in, in a personal way where you can get to, to know them a little better and what they're about. Uh, and I hope we accomplish that with Danny Briere. And he gave you all the answers for the Flyers. Um, you can get, uh, reach me on Twitter and uh, go to Twitter and, and, and you can you'll get the download of this podcast. Each and every podcast we do, we release it as soon as we can on, on uh, Thursday. So uh, by the time you're hearing this, it's already out because you're hearing it. So uh, Mike Miss 25 is my Twitter account. You can email me Mike at Mike dot com. And all the other stuff I have going on, uh, Natalie Vineyards. In fact, I'm headed down to the vineyard today to pick up some cases of wine. 
for a charity golf event where they'll be serving and giving away uh, the bottles of uh, Natale Vineyard wine. Uh, I am a part owner of that. I'm very proud to be involved with it. It's in Cape May Courthouse, New Jersey. If you're ever in the area down the shore, take a day trip out there and then grab some wine. And you can order online at nataliavineyards.com. I wouldn't steer you wrong. We produce some good wines. And I'm a wine guy, and I'm very pleased with the product with our inventor, Tim Job, doing a fantastic job out there. Uh, all right, anything else? Are we good? Uh, Joe Davis next week from Fox Sports. Joe Davis. So we have gone from... Uh, I and Eagle to Joe Davis, the two hottest broadcasters uh, right now uh, that are going. And, uh, of course, you heard uh, with Joe Davis on, on the All-Star Game, did another fine job. Uh, and I didn't realize that he was the uh, TV, a regular TV guy for the Los Angeles Dodgers. So in addition to all the stuff that he does, he has a day job with the Los Angeles Dodgers. You know, these broadcasters work their ass off. They really do. They're they go from here to there. So. Road warriors, man. Road warriors. Yeah, they really are. And uh, so it'll be a delight to talk to Joe Davis, a uh, hot young property uh, who does a fantastic job. Um, all right. So uh, everybody have a great rest of the day. Uh, enjoy your weekend. We'll come at you next week with uh, Joe Davis. Stay tuned for that. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, we hope you enjoy today's podcast as we inch up to podcast number 100. That is coming soon. That will be a special podcast for all of us. Thanks again for listening. We'll talk to you later. This is Mike Missanelli, and I'm out. Thanks for listening to the Mike Missanelli podcast on the Bet Rivers Network.